Down in the darkness of the ocean deeps, a constant game of cat and mouse is played out between the great powers of the world, with sleek, silent dealers of death listening, watching, and vying for strategic position. We're of course talking about submarines, the most survivable and least detectable platform of the world's great navies. There are three types of submarine currently employed by the US Navy. Hunter killers, also known as attack subs, are specially adapted for killing submarines and service vessels. In the US Navy, these are designated SSN, the SS standing for submarine, and the N meaning nuclear powered. Cruise missile submarines are used for standing far off the coast and raining missiles down on distant targets, and they're designated SSGN, with the G standing for guided missile. And finally, ballistic missile submarines, nicknamed boomers, are large vessels which stay hidden out at sea for significant periods of time, bearing a strategic level nuclear payload capable of wiping out multiple cities. The name Boomer comes from the loud boom which would be made by the detonation of a nuclear missile. These boats are designated SSBN, with the B standing for ballistic as they carry submarine-launched variants of intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs. Boomers are part of the US Navy's nuclear triad, the other two components being the land-based Minuteman missile silos and the long-range B-1, B-2, and the new B-21 strategic bombers. Currently, the US operates 14 boomers known as Ohio-class submarines. These vessels were first deployed in 1981 and are reaching the end of their useful lives, meaning they'll have to be replaced by 2027. What they're being replaced with is the Columbia-class SSBN. From its first conception in a Force Posture review released in 2010, the program was known as the Ohio Replacement Program, or SSBNX. In 2016, the program was renamed the Columbia Class Program, following the decision to name the class in honor of the District of Columbia, thus continuing a long tradition of U.S. Navy subs being named for cities, states, or regions. Since 2013, the Columbia Class Program has been the U.S. Navy's top priority program, meaning that nothing will interrupt its funding system. The money will be found, even if it means impacting or pausing other Navy programs. U.S. military doctrine requires the maintenance of both a first and second strike capability, meaning that they maintain the capacity to initiate a nuclear strategic strike and to respond to one with a retaliatory strike. The boomers, or SSBNs, are the most crucial part of the second strike capability, as at any given moment, a set number of boomers will be out at sea, fully armed and capable, and untouched by any nuclear strike on U.S. soil. As the Ohio-class boats started approaching the end of their lives, the Navy began putting together a plan to procure new subs. A long round of cost estimates followed, with adjustments for inflation, repricing of immature technologies, and changes in the Navy's procurement processes and systems being taken into account. The upshot is that the Columbia's will be procured at an estimated cost of 122 billion US dollars and a little bit of change. Each individual hull is estimated to cost around 8 billion dollars. As this is a submarine program, however, it's actually kind of likely the end cost is going to be much higher. Part of this has to do with the unique challenges presented by submarine procurement. Subs take a long time to build, but at the same time, the US needs to maintain technological, tactical, and strategic overmatch, given that, like most Western powers, it can't man as many platforms as its potential adversaries. This means that a tricky balancing act needs to be pulled off between actually getting the boats to sea and ensuring that their design is in line with state-of-the-art technology, as predicted to be several decades in the future. This means that the design phase is critical, and the Columbia's initial design process took significantly more than 10 years. This is partially owing to the complexity of designing vessels for the submarine environment, and also owing to adjustments required by changes in technology over the course of the project. In 2019, the company tasked with the major design missed one of their final milestones because of the implementation of a new software design tool, in the words of the Congressional Research Committee. What this basically means is that they updated their software and nobody knew how to use the program. There are also a number of less mundane challenges, probably the most important of which is the reality of building a nuclear submarine. There just aren't that many shipyards in the world capable of building a nuclear-powered submarine, and the US only has two. These are General Dynamics Electric Boats and Huntington Ingalls Industries Newport News Shipbuilding. General Dynamics was awarded the bulk of the work, with Huntington taking on the remainder. The main issue, though, is that these are the same two yards currently building the Virginia-class submarines, which are multi-mission fast attack and cruise missile subs, which are gradually replacing the Los Angeles-class boats. 
Huntington also builds and maintains nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, and both yards are at capacity. Presently, the Virginia-class production schedule is being sacrificed in favor of the construction of the Columbia boats. Quite a few of the technologies being employed in the boats, about which we can't really say very much, are reported as being immature, meaning that they're still either at prototype or testing stage. Many of these probably relate to weapons and sensors, and two key technologies are expected to reach maturity in 2023 and 2027, respectively. This represents a massive gamble, as if they don't pass testing, replacing or remediating them will cause schedule and budget blowouts for the program. In all, there is a margin of two months for delays, plus an additional but far less certain six-month cushion gained by altering the construction schedule. If everything goes right, if the timeline blows out by more than eight months, the US might find itself without a viable sea-based nuclear deterrent for a period of time. Besides the two main shipyards, there are more than 350 other companies involved in the supply chain. These companies produce components, fabricate materials, contribute to design work, or are specialists in any one of the myriad communications, targeting, propulsion, or other systems which are essential to the function of the boat. As of fiscal year 2022, the significant number of these companies were facing quality assurance and procurement and supply chain issues, some of which arose from the pandemic. It's understandable, then, that quite a bit of the Columbia-class program's time is spent, in their words, watching these companies very closely. Another potential complication arises from the fact that this is a joint project with the UK government and the Royal Navy. The USN and RN have cooperated very closely in terms of sea-based nuclear deterrence since the end of World War II, with both countries operating fleets of boomers, both carrying Trident ballistic missiles. The current Royal Navy Vanguard-class SSBNs are set to be replaced with the Dreadnought-class submarine, and both programs are coordinating with each other in terms of design and funding. Coordination of this kind, while generally a positive for the countries involved, is fraught with with difficulty. Submarine technology is an exceptionally well-guarded secret, and the administration and planning involved in sharing even the most basic information can be formidable. On top of this, both programs, the Columbia and the Dreadnought, wag a very long tail of private companies in their supply chains. It's practically certain that complications will arise from attempting to coordinate securely and effectively across two networks of this size and complexity. The construction of the first hull began at General Dynamics in 2021. The first vessel was originally planned to be called the USS Columbia, but as there's already an attack are bearing that name, this vessel's name was changed to USS District of Columbia. This District of Columbia is scheduled to be launched in 2027 or 2028, and the strong impression both private and government sources give is that there is significant anxiety about on-time delivery. The consequences of a cost or scheduling blowout would be severe. In a time of great strategic uncertainty and with a number of increasingly assertive and rapidly developing adversaries, the US military can't afford any reduction in capability, least of all in one of its most vital deterrent forces. The pressure is very much on to ensure that the first boat is actually launched on its scheduled date in 2027. The Columbia-class SSBN will displace 20,810 tons submerged, two more tons than the Ohio, thus making this the largest submarine ever built by the US. It will be 560 feet long, that's 171 meters, which is the same as the Ohio-class. The diameter will be 43 feet or 13 meters, one meter more than the Ohio, which is where the extra displacement comes from. Given that it's nuclear-powered, its cruising range is theoretically unlimited. The only limiting factor is how long the crew can be kept at sea, and as submarine crews rotate between vessels, a Columbia-class boat could, in theory, stay at sea indefinitely between maintenance periods. Publicly available information says Columbia-class boats will have a dive capacity in excess of 200 meters, but that's what it says for nearly every submarine. The simple fact is that the Navy knows how deep their subs can dive, and they're just not telling. They will have 16 missile tubes equipped for Trident to D-5 submarine launch ballistic missiles. The nuclear electric propulsion system will be capable of speeds in excess of 20 knots. This figure is like the dive depth number, in that the true maximum speed is likely unknown as yet, and almost certainly to be classified when someone does find it out. The control surfaces, basically the steering vanes at the stern of the boat, will be in an X configuration. This layout makes the boat much quieter when submerged as the cross-shaped falls reduce turbulence. In addition, they provide much greater maneuverability on the surface than a standard rudder and impeller or propeller system. This solves a problem which plagued the higher class boats, which were notorious for being difficult to pilot in enclosed waters and to bring safely to a berth. Surface maneuverability is also important for evolution, such as helicopter transfers and refueling, both processes which require precise control of course and speed on the surface. 
In terms of unclassified, publicly available information, probably the most innovative part of the boat will be its drive system. Nuclear-powered vessels have essentially always been steam-powered. The nuclear reactor heats water, creating steam, which is then used to power pistons, which in turn rotate a mechanical drive shaft. The planned nuclear electric drive is different in that the reactor will provide its power to an electrically powered system. For obvious reasons, there isn't a lot of information out there about how exactly it will do this, but there are two broad possibilities. The first is to have the nuclear reactor powering a dynamo, which then transfers energy to be stored in a battery. The second is that some sort of transformer technology will convert and store the nuclear energy as electrical power more directly. While the US Navy has built nuclear electric vessels before and currently uses a propulsion system of this type in vessels like the Zumwalt-class destroyer, it has never built any vessel with this particular combination of advanced technologies. Electric drives have several advantages over mechanical systems. Possibly most importantly for a submarine is the fact that they are significantly quieter. Nuclear subs are generally much louder than their diesel electric counterparts as they constantly have pistons and pumps going to power and cool their mechanical propulsion gear. An electric drivetrain would need significant significantly less in the way of noisy moving parts, and the action of the electric motor in itself is much quieter than all the pistons and rotors clanking away in a mechanical engine. Another advantage is power usage. Up to 80% of the power generated by the reactor in a mechanical boat is required for propulsion, and this load is basically constant. With the new electrical system, the power requirement is not constant, so once the drivetrain has been fully powered, the electrical energy provided by the reactor can be rerouted to other systems within the boat. This is significant as it frees up a large amount of power for weapons and sensors and potentially for quality of life features to help the sailors get through their very long stints at sea. And finally, the increased efficiency of the electric drive system means that it will significantly cut down on time in refit. For the Ohio-class boats, their nuclear reactor requires refueling at the midlife stage. This is a lengthy, expensive, and hazardous process, which takes four years, meaning that in order to have the requisite number of boomers at sea at any given time, there need to be 14 hulls in total. As the Columbia-class boat's reactor is expected to last for the entirety of its 42-year service life, its middle-of-life refit only involves non-nuclear-related refurbishments and modifications. This process takes only two years, which means that in order to have the required number of hulls at sea at any given time, the minimum number of boats required drops to 12. The Columbia-class program states that it will acquire this minimum of 12 boats, but it's very possible the US Navy might procure more than this. Both the UK and US Navy SSBMs carry Trident submarine launch ballistic missiles. This variant of the ICBM, called an SLBM, is designed to be launched from, well, a submarine. The way an ICBM works is that it is fired into high suborbital flight about 620 miles or 1,000 kilometers up. Massive amounts of energy are expended in getting the missile suborbital, but after this, its flight is mostly powered by gravity, though some have small guidance rockets. There are a variety of guidance systems which are mostly classified, but they generally use some sort of imaging, GPS, star shots which give the missile the ability to orient by the position of the stars, or a combination of these systems. Given that massive amounts of energy are only required for the first phase of flight, unlike cruise missiles which require propulsion from launch to terminal, SLBMs can carry very large payloads over long distances with much greater efficiency. The massive energy burst at launch does present challenges, however, and the missile launch tubes on a submarine need to be carefully designed. The Columbia-class launches are being built via a new and innovative modular construction system. Each module, known as a quad pack, contains four tubes, which can be built independently and then are later fitted to corresponding modules near the midpoint of the hull when completed. This allows for much more rapid construction and testing. In terms of the missiles themselves, it's important to note that many capabilities and limitations surrounding weapons of this kind are classified. This means that publicly available information about ranges and so on can vary from source to source as minimums or publicly acknowledged figures sometimes vary in both substance and interpretation. Having said that, here are the broad vital stats for the Trident II D5 SLBM. Each Columbia will have up to 16 Trident missiles. These are solid fuel rockets tipped with up to 14 W76-1 thermonuclear warheads. This is significantly more firepower than the current missiles carried by the Ohios, which only have four or five per missile. Each of these warheads has a destructive force six times greater than the bomb which was dropped on Hiroshima. If the Columbia were to pack a full suite of missiles, they would each be capable of unleashing the equivalent of more than 6.3 million tons of TNT on targets as far as 4,800 miles or 7,724 kilometers away. For context, the distance between New York and Moscow is roughly 7,500 kilometers or 4,660 miles. 
It's unlikely that they would have a full complement, however, as the intention is to also carry a set of conventional cruise missiles, as there's a requirement for submarines to be capable of multiple different mission types. As well as this, they need to be able to defend themselves from other submarines and surface ships, as well as attacking targets of opportunity. To this end, the Columbia class will also be fitted with the next generation Mark 48 torpedoes, which will be fired from tubes at the bow of the vessel. These are long range guided torpedoes, which are capable of destroying a large ship with a single shot. The way they do this is that the torpedo travels towards its target powered by extremely high octane fuel until its systems detect that it's underneath the keel of the target vessel. Its payload then explodes. This creates an extremely rapidly expanding bubble of energy beneath the ship. This lifts the target out of the water, doing so with a force so great that it instantly jellifies any personnel unfortunate enough to be in the direct path of the explosion. As rapidly as this bubble of energy expands, it then collapses, slamming the target back down into the water and essentially breaking it in half. A test firing of the Mark 48 against a decommissioned destroyer named the Torrens broke the vessel in half and sent it to the bottom in less than 30 seconds. The primary mission of the Columbia class subs will be to move invisibly within range of strategically important targets ready to unleash a retaliatory nuclear strike. To maintain this readiness, a higher class boats conduct daily fire drills at random times, going through the whole launch sequence without knowing whether or not the fire order is genuine until the very last stage, when the captain checks the final authorization codes. It's a safe assumption that the Columbia class boats will operate a similar, if not identical, routine. In addition to this, they'll be tasked with deterrent patrols, basically popping up within range of a target to let the adversary know that they're within striking distance. And finally, they'll be tasked with all the other secret squirrel stuff that submarines do, listening in on communications, stealthily inserting personnel ashore, and collecting information on other ships and submarines. Nuclear submarines stay at sea for extended periods of time. Their systems are demanding both to operate and maintain, and the pattern of life aboard when at sea is hot, cramped, uncomfortable, and intensely busy. As the vessel requires 24-hour operation, crew members stand watches around the clock, meaning that they rarely, if ever, get a full night's sleep, often for many months at a time. So the next time you're staring out to sea, spare a thought for all those submariners out there providing a crucial element of national security for the US and its allies.